Now Planet is a laboratory experimenting for 3.8 billion years. Are the answers to humanity's greatest challenges all around us? Now, Patrick, Evolve is extraordinary. It's so fast. It's so packed with information. You've divided, categorized your research or presentation into explore, survive, cure, protect, move, and restore. Yeah. But thematically, it's, uh, it's about how tech can save us. This show, this series, is it's about biomimicry. So that's the field of study where you look towards Mother Nature, towards the natural world, to find out about the solutions that all these different species, these millions of species that we share the, the world with, the planet with, and how they've overcome certain challenges in their world and how that crosses over and relates to the problems and challenges that we face in, in our modern day today. We, we try and look at how each of those, those adaptations, um, I like to refer to it as Mother Nature's blueprints, these 3.8 billion year old blueprints, um, which essentially is just a lot of R&D time. So each of these species over millennia, over millions of years, are slowly evolving, they're slowly adapting, uh, their DNA are, is, is undergoing uh, very small mutations, and sometimes those mutations give the animal a really good advantage. So similarly, if we take that same principle of survival of the fittest, we should be able to, we've got 3.8 billion years worth of, of, of material to look through. Humanity's only been here for a sliver of that amount of time. Yeah, <clears throat> so it, it's really exciting when you look at it from that perspective. Um, and so you ask the question, how realistic are some of these technologies? I, I would have to admit, some of them are really far-fetched. We talk about one of the animals that we, uh, that we looked into was the, um, was it the wood frog? I can't remember the names now. So many different animals, the wood frog. Um, and it has the ability to undergo, it, it, its whole body can be frozen. It can be frozen alive. That was so strange. <laughs> yeah. But then when it thaws out, it's still alive. Um, and that's to do with certain chemicals, that, uh, um, uh, molecules that it's putting into its body, a type of antifreeze, which stops its cells from bursting. We can be inspired by that frog to help us uh, further the advancement of technologies like, cry like cryogenics. So imagine cryogenically freezing human beings and sending them light years across the cosmos, all thanks to a tiny, a tiny little frog. That is quite far-fetched, but then you do have other technologies which have real life applications, which are gonna help people and can also benefit uh, the wallets of innovative businesses. So there's this thing, this new technology called Sharklet, <clears throat> which was developed after scientists were looking at, at, at the detail of shark skin. Sharks, considering they live in, uh, in the marine environment, are, are quite clean. Long story short, these dermal denticles, it's the these, these scaly kind of skin, it's almost like sandpaper, smooth one way, really rough the other way, has this property where it stops bacteria from being able to stick onto its skin. It's, it's really hard for bacteria to stick on. And if it wants to stick on, it has to use lots of energy. But in nature, things that uh, animals and species don't want to use energy. So bacteria doesn't stick to it. Remember, we're coming from a global pandemic. Granted that COVID-19 is caused by a virus, but you could have a pandemic which is caused by a bacteria. And the, uh, hospitals have, uh, have so, spend so much money on secondary infections. You can imagine hospitals coated in these surfaces, which then stop these this bacteria from reproducing it can't even stick onto the surface so uh yeah in, in terms of wow. real world applications you know th this this biomimicry is going to be big business and has the potential to not only save us but also all the millions of species out there this global journey is the culmination of my years in the wild look how close they get wow your enthusiasm is so infectious and you <laughs> love your subject so much yeah. and you know there's plenty of goodwill there about how to help people mm. and mm. how to make it a better world mm. um tell me tell us uh, my audience a little bit about the seals that you found seals. those were just beautiful vis of you in the in the boat kayaks oh the yes seals the cape in, first seal. in africa yeah, Cape fur seals, uh, hundreds, um, thousands of them. 
uh, we went to um, a spot in Southern Africa. We were on the uh, coast of Namibia, one of my favorite countries. In fact, it's my top country to visit. And then we, we arrived in the morning. It was really foggy. Uh, and all you could hear was, <clears throat> I'm going to try and do this properly. It was like, Good. oh. oh, oh. <laughs> now, to, like to me, like if you didn't know what you were looking out for, you might think that you were literally stuck <clears throat> in the middle uh, of a herd of zombie sheep. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what it sounded like. But but that is the sound of thousands <laughs> of these Cape fur seals, uh, and eventually the the fog kind of lifted the sun. I like burnt away the fog and then poof, this beautiful blue sky, be beautiful blue ocean. And we had the pleasure of going in there uh, in kayaks. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we wanted to get a, a really close up view of these seals. They're so curious. Um, and, and that's why they're, you know, they're often re referred to as dogs of the ocean. They are literally so curious and they use, in particular, their super sense, kind of a, a little bit how dogs have a, a really good sense of smell. For, for these seals, their super sense lies in their whiskers. So their, their face is lined with loads and loads of receptors and these really long whiskers that come out here. And what they, what they use those whiskers for is to detect um, different pressure waves or, or, or changes in movement in the water. And what are they after? Fish. They absolutely love fish and they can detect the, the stream, the wake of a fish that has gone past them a minute prior. Again, thinking back to Mother Nature's blueprints, this is what seals have evolved and adapted for because they have to, that those waters off the coast of Namibia can be quite murky. So they can't always see their prey. They have to kind of almost feel their way. Yeah, they have to feel the wake of the fish. For anybody that's gone wakeboarding, when you're behind that boat and you see that wake that you're kind of riding, that is essentially what those fish are doing on a really minute, minute scale. And it's those whiskers that are able to detect that. You, uh, scientists have been able to, to work out, you know, exactly what it is that that's helping them to find these fish. And, it, and, it's, and it's, the, it, it's the way that their whiskers pick up different types of vibrations. And so the theory is that we can take that same uh, process and apply it to underwater um, submersibles. And so that the, 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 the what we're trying to do is, is learn from other nature and maybe we can potentially, in that story we were talking about exploring different planets, you know, how we can detect things underwater. If we were to go to a, a, a moon like Europa, for example, it's covered in this thick sheet of ice, but underneath we think there's water there, but it's gonna be pretty dark. So how are we going to see you know, it's something which you might classify as real world all the way to something as fantastical as, as traveling, traveling to an, a, a, an alien world. Can shape our future. I've never seen wings like that before. I got the need for speed. Oh yeah, baby. Big breaths of air. Oh! What I'm holding right now is mud. Mixed in with a little bit of poop. <laughs> Your series made me wonder um, I have some wild rabbits outside and it hit minus 40 last week and it's been really cold and I didn't see them for a few days. I thought, oh my God, they've been frozen to death. So I went out hunting, couldn't find them. Well, they showed up. So I looked them up and they have adaptations. They've got really thick skin, skin so thick you can't put a needle in it. Oh, wow. So, thank you. I found out how they do well. <laughs> nice. Well, I've learned something new as well. <laughs> I love learning. I love learning new things. <laughs> Thank brilliant. you so much. What a delight to speak to you. And I look forward to the next series. I saw this and I said, can I make it? This could save millions and millions of lives. This could be used for inspection of nuclear power plants, for example. Squid are going to help us solve this problem of plastic pollution. Oh my God, that is so cool. <laughs> Do you think this might help us discover life on another planet? There we go. I can think of no greater argument to protect the natural world than the fact that there could be an animal, plant, or even a microbe that will save us all.